Please give me a warm welcome and enjoy the presentation. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, good morning. Um, so before I start, a bit about myself. Um, I'm Dan, and I work as a freelance um, technical architecture and development consultant, which is basically a really wanky way of saying that I build stuff for the web. Um, the... Other thing that that means is that as a consultant, I move around companies a lot, and in doing so, I've managed to notice a sorry, I've managed to notice a um, some patterns along the line at, around the lack of architectural thinking within companies, and this is ranging from startups to corporates. It's like across the board, and this is this is great news for me because it means I never really want for work, but it's it's a bad thing for the industry because we need people thinking architecturally and thinking through problems and things. So, uh, so that's all I'm good. But so, sort of, what is a software architect? So, uh, as a software architect, my deliverables are slightly different to that of a standard developer. My main deliverable as an architect is quality. That's not just quality of the code, but it's quality of the development processes and of the workflows within the teams. It's making sure that we can scale everything when we need to. Um, it's about making sure that we don't box ourselves into any dead ends that are going to hinder us down the line. And it's primarily about ensuring the quality of the system as a whole and making sure that someone is keeping an eye and making sure that we're building the very best product product that is possi uh, we possibly can. Uh, so that's all in good, but why should you be bothered about this? Um, why should you care and why should you want to th what start thinking architecturally and so on? And I can't really answer that, but I can give you a few insights into what I think is important. And I could stand up here and I could give you like the, the business pitch of filling a vacuum. Um, I could give you the, I could talk about the financial incentives as well, but to be honest, I'd be lying about all of that. And the, the main reason I care about it, the, the crux of it is that I am both simultaneously the biggest perfectionist and the most lazy person I know of. And due to that, I want every pro everything I build, every project I work on, to be as close as perfection as possible. But I'm bone idle and want to put in the least amount of work to get it to that point. And this comes down to the basic fact as well that all good developers, in my view, are lazy. You want to put, do the least amount of work and get the most out of it. Um, so... Uh, Sorry. Um, okay. So, with that in mind, uh, it's like if I'm going to sell anything nowadays, you're going to have a five-step plan, right? And this is where I find out if all these years working around marketing people has actually rubbed off any, and whether or not I can sell it to you. So, I, here we have a have what I am essentially calling my five-step plan for a. Uh, a better, lazier, more architect architecturally thinking you. <laughs> so, step one, communication. So, as an industry, we've, we've done some amazing things, right? We've, we built Facebook and Twitter. We built, going further back, we built the email systems. We built a huge slew in, um, of um, instant messengers and all the different chat platforms and everything else. And... It's like we, we did something amazing. We shrunk the world and revolutionized the way that people communicate. And yet we are all thoroughly shit at doing it ourselves. Um, it's like it, it amazes me just how, how poorly we all communicate. And I know we live, we live in an industry stereotyped by socially awkward introverts, but something seems to be going beyond that. And it's, it's quite beyond me. It's, um, uh, so yeah, we we all seem to suck at it for some reason, and 
I've worked in I've worked in numerous teams now where the team I'm working with don't ha seem to have any idea as to what they're building. They have no idea what they're being tasked, what the people they're working for want them to build, because nobody's felt it, that felt it necessary to ask the right questions, to try and speak with the stakeholders and work out what they're after. Um, I've worked in another team where a vast amount of time and resources were put into building around the fact that another system was not quite um, what they needed. And so they wrote loads and loads of code to get around all of the issues they had with that system. And everything was done defensively, and it was like they built a wall around themselves. They, they tried to defend themselves from this other system. And that, that might make sense in some cases, except in this case, the team responsible for that system was sat no more than six foot away. And rather than actually strike up a conversation, start the dialogue, and try and resolve problems, they built both teams had built walls around themselves, and the only thing that they were left with was a mess. Um, these, these sound like extreme cases, like the, the radical end of the spectrum cases, but the thing that I found from moving from company to company, from between corporates, startups, um, agencies, etc., is that this is this is starting to look like the norm, and I can't be the only one that finds that crazy, right? Uh, so, one of the most vital um, parts of my job as an architect is to basically speak with people, to to try and work out what it is that people are, what it, what it is that people want to be want, um, what is it they want us to build. This is unfortunately not always what they're asking us to build. Um, which is incredibly helpful, but but yeah, it's it's all about speaking with stakeholders, um, trying to understand what they're after, dealing, um, chatting with UX people. Um, the UX people are great; they know they know where this, what what we're building. They have a better idea than anyone else because when you're in the business of the web, you're basically building experience, and that's their trade. So, working with them to find out what page they're on now, where they're heading. It's like this might sound like a lot of meetings. Um, yeah, we all hate meetings. I hate meetings as much as everyone else, and I found that they're actually pretty useless. The most, the most, um, the most effective way I found of working out where someone's at, what they're after, is basically going for burgers at lunchtime and having a chat, or having a chat in the pub on a Friday night. It's like all these little informal chats, um, chats with people, help you build a a picture of of what you're after. And that leads into to step two. Um, so all of that communication, all of that, all of that, all of those chats, all of that communication, it's all about trying to find, uh, sorry. It's all about trying to get an idea of the big picture, trying to see Sorry, trying to visualize what the the system that you're building, um, and the more detail you have, the more the more information you have, the more detailed that picture of the system becomes. And unless you actually know what you're building, there's not actually much point in a team writing code, right? So, uh, um, so what? Armed with, the armed with this big picture, after, after um, speaking with everyone, you're then able to, if you, you are then armed with something, something really handy. If you know where the, if you can visualize the current state of the system, as well as the various other future states, you are then able to choose the most efficient path between those states. And in doing that, you, you reduce work, you minimize the, the amount of overhead you have to do. You can, you can work out where things are similar, you can combine that work, you can split things up. It's basically working out the, the most efficient way to get the code written for the system that you're looking at. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's all about efficiency, and I've missed, I missed a slide there. <laughs> um, uh, so. 
So yeah, this is um, on with the big picture. It's uh, doing my best not to sound like a Boy Scout. It's all about being prepared. And if you, so uh, every, every project will have key points at which they're aiming to deal with certain um, thresholds of users, take on certain clients, um, scale to certain levels. Um, the, the key point I find is, as being an architect, is that I need to, I need to be on top of that. I need to know where, where these points are, and I need to know what the state, state the system needs to be in those points. This is arcing back to the big picture point. point. But if, if I know the system is going to need to handle um, a million users in six months, um, for some reason, it's always a million users in six months. I'm not sure where those numbers come from, but every company seems to have that, have them. But it's about it's not about building a system out straight out the bat that will deal with that traffic. It's like actually having the code written is not that important. It's about having the plan. How do we get from where we are now to where we need to be, and to make sure we get there as we need to be there. So no time is wasted building, building out a system at the start that will scale to infinity and beyond. And then it turns out that these sites are actually going to have a few very high paying customers rather than a million low paying ones. It's about, keep, it's about knowing, knowing the points that you need to, you need to hit and ensuring that you have the plan to get there. Um, uh, Okay. Um, fine. So, uh, the fourth step is to optimize. Um, as an architect, you should always be optimizing. Optimizing. This. This is going to sound weird, but um, it's not necessarily optimizing in the traditional sense. So when most people think about optimizing, they think about optimizing for either cost or for speed. Neither of those two things are actually important at all in the grand scheme of things. Um, when you're starting, until you hit a certain point in a project, which is normally way, way, way beyond where most people think it is, there's no point in optimizing for either speed or for either speed of execution or for, um, for cost saving because the financial, um, the cost savings that come from being able to turn new features around very quickly will vastly dwarf at the start of any project the savings you might make from micro optimizations in the running. It's all about, it's all about optimizing for what I like to call, um, it's like for what I like to call optimizing for developer agility. You want to make sure that while building software, that you don't box yourselves into any roots. You, you make sure that the code base is able to be extended cleanly and easily at all times. It's about working out the parts of the system that are best um, abstracted and making sure that when they're written the first time round, they're written in a way that can be easily abstracted when you hit that problem the second time. And then when you hit that the third time, you've already got the code there. It's about building up, building up um, as big a repository of reusable code in a project as possible, so that with each new feature and new, with each new feature that you implement, you are exponentially cutting the amount of time and effort required. So all of this arcing back to to my earlier statements about being lazy. It's it's about reducing the overhead of of the development and. And when we don't have to deal with that much, um, when we don't have to deal with writing that much boilerplate and everything else, we can actually focus on the fun things. We can we can get to the, the to implement in the actual business logic the stuff that we're probably working on the project for, and rather than just going through the same motions over and over and over again with each new feature. Uh, 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 
Sorry. The, the fifth step would be automation. Um, so I hate, doing th I hate doing work myself. The answer to that is to get, it's like I own, a vast, I own a bunch of machines. I have servers at my disposal. I want them to do the work for me. Um, so the key rule here I find is that you find yourself doing something a second time round. It should be replaced with a shell script. We um, we spend a lot of we seem to spend a lot of time doing things that aren't necessarily ne necessary. When you, I see this a lot with especially around deployments as well. The amount of manual steps that people seem to include in their deployment um, processes. There is only there is only one step that should be required to deploy code to servers, and that's the hit go. And from there, all systems should kick in that deal with the rest. It should all be abstracted into shell scripts, into um, Capistrano jobs, into whatever system you choose to use. It should be automated. The same for, the same for builds, the same for testing. Um, when, you have a, when you have a solid bank of tests, both uh, the integration, the functional, and the, and the unit level, Suddenly, as a developer, our jobs have become that much more simpler and that much more easier because we stop having to worry about bugs. We can make sweeping changes to code bases and, and have faith that we've not broken anything elsewhere in the system. The, amount of o the, the debugging overhead that we have drops dramatically, and, and again, the work involved drops down. Um, so yeah, the golden rule with this is if you find yourself doing something for a second time, then if you're doing it manually, you're doing it wrong. There should be, you should be automating it. Let the machines handle it because it's not that often you hear things failing due to machine error. It's normally human error. Uh, um, uh, and I'm going through these slides a lot quicker than I was hoping to, but uh, the the law. So that's basically it from the um, from what I can actually tell you about thinking architecturally. If if you can start thinking in those five areas and reevaluating your project from projects from those standpoints. Then that's that's already a good start in itself, and will lead to will lead to more sorry will lead to a better more work built um, well built project. Everything else on top of that is experience, and that's something you only gain by moving around, trying new teams. And it's like the the key thing is to keep moving forward to to try all of the different kinds of companies out there to try startups to try corporate, to take the experience from each of those. And with each company you work for, you gain new experiences that you can apply to the next. And with that in mind, it's, you never stop learning. It's a, const it's a case of constantly learning. And as an architect, as an architect, you're forced into that position that you have to stay on top of all of the new tech. You have to you have to understand all the new techniques. You know you need to know the what the best practice is and how it's evolving, so you can relay this onto your team and keep everyone uh, and help keep everyone else learning. So, uh, yeah. unfortunately, that's um, I've managed to go through most of my content a lot quicker than I hoped. But that's all, folks. But do we have any questions? Yep. Uh. Uh, just the idea of you being a perfectionist and being idle is interesting. And do you think that's a difficult thing to combine? Do you, can you only combine that by stepping away from doing so much coding yourself? Uh, not really. I 
So I still write a, a lot of code. Um, I work a lot. I pair up with the other developers in the teams. I do a lot of mentoring with the with the junior devs on our team. Um, pairing is actually one of the most effective ways I found of of imparting that sort of uh, imparting what needs to be built onto other people. But and it also means I only have to do half the work. So um, uh, the um, See, I think I think deep down most of us are most of us are fairly lazy in ourselves. It's what makes us it's what makes us want to be developers. We want it's like why why are we writing code to to do things when we could we could actually be sat there doing it ourselves. It would just be longer and less interesting. And it's only I find it's more a case of actually embracing the fact that I'm lazy and I'm working with that to try and work out. I find that help that helps me try and find the the um, the most efficient route to the to the solution. Which and when you're building when you're building software, the most simple the most simple thing is normally the that solves a problem is normally the best solution in itself. So anything that stops you with the stops you f uh, the the big problem that we have as developers is. We like to race ahead of ourselves. So when faced with a problem, we want to dive straight into the code, start hammering out code, and we start writing loads and loads of it, and we start thinking about all of the future possible cases that could be happening, and we're going to code, we're going to code something in for, that deals with every one of them right now, right here in, in, this, in this first cut of the software. And then none of those future, future situations ever come up. And it's like, so now we've got... Now we've got a code base that's, that's infinitely larger than it needed to be, far more complex than it needed to be, and far more prone to error and bugs and everything else. And whereas if we'd taken the step back at the, at the beginning, if we'd, asked, if we'd asked the questions that needed to be asked and worked out what needed to be built, then we could have just built that one small precise thing. And that, in my view, would have been perfect. Does that help answer yeah, your question? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Got another one of it. Is it? Yeah. Um, well, it was just that. Um, do you see um, as coding uh, and developing becomes more um, of an accepted sort of thing to discuss in the general media and amongst the general population? Do you see uh, different types of people coming along and coming into uh, and starting out as devs in you know the people you come across has that changed at all uh, yes and no it's well back when I f first started coding um, uh, or sorry when I first started finding other coders online which was it took me quite a while after learning to find the internet but um, the everyone there was at that point self was a self taught normally had learned on some device that was originally um, is it, which it, whose original purpose was gaming something like the um, so when you went out you brought an Amstrad you brought one of the Amstrad CPCs you brought a um, you brought an Amiga you brought a Spectrum etc you brought it for the games and then they were sort of coerced into development through by wanting to create games, I'm I'm very much of the opinion that games are a gateway drug to development. Um, so, and you you sort of head headed off that way. You started coding, and then off you go. You get the qualifications you needed to go do that as a career. But I found myself recently working around a lot more people who are actually fairly good junior devs who have come from say different um, forms of engineering. So mechanical engineering things who have later realized that their their industries are, are slowly dying in this country with and that have been the smart ones that have made the jump to what is there out there with what is there that's interesting and they've started to venture into into development and they bring with them interesting thoughts on their own of different approaches that they've seen work in in a, in a radically different yet similar um, field and it wouldn't be the, the first thing we've borrowed from, 
from that industry. So one of the, um, uh, when we look at some of the agile uh, methodologies we have, Kanban being one of the, the biggest, that was created to help Toyota build, um, build cars more efficiently. And yet one of, a lot of its biggest successes have been in helping dev teams turn around projects and keep, turning, keep projects going. Going, so it's most, yeah, so I think uh, in answer to the question, I'm seeing, I've, I've seen a lot more people coming into the industry later from, from different backgrounds and I, I'm personally of opinion that's a good thing. But. And do you think there's um, enough? I mean, are there enough good young uh, starting out developers coming in? And in the future, do you think there will be enough? Uh, um, I think there might be a bit of a, a bit of a gap at the moment, and the, there don't seem to be enough people coming through the education system to fill the roles that are out there. Um, which, as developers, mean that we're in a very good position at the moment. It's a it's very much a seller's market, and we can pick and choose the work we want to we want to do. But um, there's a lot of new initiatives out there. There's things like Co Club. Um, these are these are starting to teach kids at an even younger age to start thinking like developers to start solving problems. Um, and and. I have no doubt that in years to come, we're going to start seeing coding as a far more um, common skill amongst people. And uh, at that point, then it, will be, then it will become more important that we have, um, when, pe when, we ha when we have a lot more developers, we're going to need a lot more people to do the, all the annoying communication bit above, which is where and the thinking and the big picture, th big picture thinking on a project, which is where the architects would then come in. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, Hi. Um, so you spoke about taking a step back and asking the right questions, but can you talk a bit more about the role of the architect in doing that? Is that something that you do, or do you rely on like a project management or account management function um, to do that? So, 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 um, okay. So, project managers, account um, uh, business analysts, CTOs, etc. All of these people's jobs are jobs are very similar to that have some overlap with um, that of an architect. But a lot of the actual conversation and trying to drag out exactly what we need to build will come from speaking with them um, and working with them, working with them as well. So I will work with the, tech, with the project managers to, to task out what work needs to be done to hit the features that the business is asking for. But Someone actually needs to do the needs to work out what needs to be done from a technical side. And if you don't have highly technical project managers, who um, I found it's the the architect the the need for an architect in that side becomes less when you have project managers who went into that field via code via coding themselves. Um, but when you have project managers who are a lot more business orientated then they don't understand the complexities of the system and everything else. And based on that, it's a lot easier for them to sit down with an architect and work out what the tasks are that need to be performed than it is to sit there and try and figure it out themselves. Um, another thing I find is that uh, many of the good CTOs I've worked with have also, have also had been quite architectural in the way that they think about things. And they will have an understanding of all this thing, this stuff. But as CTOs, they also have a lot more responsibilities, mostly managing upwards and keeping business people away from the tech team so that we can actually do work, <laughs> which is in itself the most valuable thing you can have in a company. Because without that, just nothing happens. And you, you end up ask, answering stupid questions continuously. But, <laughs> but at times, they will be so wrapped up in that that they failed to communicate fully the, 
the vision they have for, for the system. So being able to work, in that case, being able to sit and chat with them and work out what it is that they need and ask, ask the questions of them, I'm then able to get the idea of, the, of what we're building and then I can, I can relay that to the rest of the team because I, have, I don't have the overhead that they have. Um, but it also, it also, it also at times involves um, dealing with business people. So um, chatting with the, the business analysts, chatting with um, product owners and, and things, working out where, where their thinking is. Because if, if I understand what they're thinking and where they're, where they're aiming for, then I can, I can use that to kind of try and predict where things are going with the, where things are going with the, with the platform and make sure that the, the stuff we're building easily takes us into that path. Um, and then there's, um, there's a lot of stuff around speaking with the design side as well, because as I said earlier, if you're, if you're, in, the, if you're in the business of, of building web apps, um, web, when, you're set, when you're building web apps, what you're actually, your actual product, product is an experience. And that is what user experience, um, that's why you have a user experience designer. That's why you have a design team. And these are the guys that are going to know more than anything where things are actually heading now. They're the ones doing that work. They're the ones doing the guiding. guiding. They're getting, and they work as a, very, a great filter to business as to what, what's happening next. But does that answer the question? Cool. Ah. Okay, any other, any other questions? In that case, um, uh, I think I think we're done then. So, thank you and. Uh.